Film-based video games and video game-based films are synonymous with financial failure and an overall sense of untruthful adaptation. With that in consideration, Star Wars benefits from an ever-expanding mythos in which each scene from each film can potentially have unwritten details added in future narratives, although the catalog of movie games is… uh, best put, subpar? Up to 2005, the only market for Star Wars games was with titles labeled either Knights of the Old Republic or Jedi Academy. However, with film stunt coordinator Nick Allard helming combat and Hayden Christensen serving as an animation model, Revenge of the Sith launched and became a deeply expansive addition to the equally fantastic movie, adding cut scenes, entirely new lore, and intense deep-rooted lightsaber combat rivaling, and in my opinion, even beating the likes of Jedi Knight, Jedi Academy. Before I get into the ranking, I want to mention that I spent literal hours learning and training with the string combat system in order to get better quality gameplay and a more complete understanding of the combat. Because of my incorrectly played first run through, I had a warped perspective on the bosses and so I promptly refought and re-recorded all the fights as well. With fantastically fun combat and extended, non-canon differences to some of the most important expositional moments found throughout the movie, Revenge of the Sith is quite fun and surefire delivers on many aspects. Let's get into it. Bosses like this are a gift. About six months ago, I had the blessing of ranking the bosses of The Force Unleashed 2, one of the worst sequels in the history of, well, anything, and with it I was able to rant and rant and rant for a very fun 12 minutes. No, I'm not gonna bore you to death with a monotonous, rage-fueled rampage, but I am going to say I was absolutely absolutely miserable fighting a ship. I'm already not a huge fan of older video games due mainly to their clunkiness and consistent ability to overthink every concept within, and this is just simply the best example of why I think pre-Xbox 360 and PS3 era games are just not that great. Revenge of the Sith prides itself on its lightsaber combat, so when there's a sequence not featuring a lightsaber in use, it's subpar. Instead, you have to rely on the erratic force grip mechanic, which is like trying to control a string puppet from the top of the Burj Khalifa. If this game had achievements, I reckon one for being able to hit the Sheetapede class shuttle with all the explosive barrels without tossing them into a wall or an invisible Nemoidian guard would be an ample addition. The issue is that this is your biggest form of damage and also your least likely because of how inept the system itself is. I've heard you can throw your lightsaber instead of this, as if that's ever worked anyways, although I found your best chance of coming out on top to be through, of all things, Force Lightning. While even at tier 3, Force Lightning is bar none useless, the transport shuttle is actually quite susceptible to it, susceptible being relative, and even so, the lightning tactic is very prone to bugs. Twice I beat the shuttle, only for it to, well, not die, leaving new Gunray in the hotbox maybe forever. That is one thing about horrible repetitive bosses I've found, they usually come with their own bag of tricks preventing you from winning fairly, and when you finally overcome that tsunami sized road bump, you have a level of satisfaction even platting the game doesn't beat. If you somehow manage to avoid its simply ridiculous laser, this fight isn't so bad, although once again it heavily suffers from not being a lightsaber encounter, and it also doesn't help with it consistently playing Matt Lucas's unbearable Anakin portrayal. You will try, my old friend. On a lasting note, if you actually play the game, you'll realize how much it, as a whole, suffers from not having Revenge of the Sith soundtrack, in this case Anakin's Dark Deeds, and so as not to repeat myself later on, no battle of the heroes in the Darth Vader fight. I wish I could play these songs over the gameplay for reference, but trust me, the difference is spectacular. I really do find it neat how many different scenarios this game creates, such as Alex and I's niche favorite character Poggle the Lesser getting squashed like an ant and the boardroom slaughter to top, however, these sometimes unnecessary inclusions, such as new Gunray survival, led to intolerable bits of gameplay with his sheath of pea transport shuttle notoriously headlining the back end of the list. The Lati feels like it should have been a platforming segment or something along those lines because the game would have benefited from it just not existing. I'm pretty sure you can damage it through the explosive barrels on the bridge, although thanks to the endless waves of clones throughout, odds are either they'll shoot them, you'll hit them on accident, or the gunship will blow them up for you through its missiles. The gunship itself isn't even dangerous, it's more of a nuisance on the ears that does nothing at all with regards to legitimate harm, and the fight verges on passively easy. Although, with to my knowledge there being only a single linear route to victory, there is otherwise nothing more to this fight. Seeing as there are two, well, technically three crab droids, I figured due to the two from the main game being so different in moveset and the third being so miserable, I'd discard the challenge one and count the others as separate bosses. With the mission 7 crab droid, there's less to it than the one from the following level, seeing as all you do is grapple its head, jump on top, hit it a few times, and repeat. 
Its only counter is an area-wide swipe that's easily enough jumped over, although I will credit how you feel vaguely similar to the Crab Droid clone from the Battle of Utapau. This is more of a fight than a gimmick, and in turn it's more enjoyable. While this scrap droid is much harder and even tedious on occasion, I do appreciate the larger move pool and more chaotic arena filled with droids and clones alike. There's not much substance past the fight being simply an overall more aggressive encounter, although that pushes beyond the shit eating dregs that make up the bottom third of the list. While Old Ben is debatably not a boss, he qualifies based on our standards as he has a health bar, his own in-game segment, even if a post-game challenge, and also is different in AI and moveset from his younger self. Playing as Vader isn't on the levels of Force Unleashed Introduction Vader or Fallen Order Vader, but it feels righteously fair as both you and Kenobi are extremely similar in power, playing into Vader's fear of his former master. Like 19 years prior, Obi-Wan is extremely defensive, although packs more of a punch in his counter and combo abilities, with my personal strat being to spam the life out of Vader's charged heavy and critical attacks. A New Hope is one of my all-time favorite movies, and it was great to see it given a minor spotlight in this game. Finally, we hit the main game Jedi and Sith bosses, with Battlemaster Sin Dralig heading the rear of that group. As played by Nick Gillard, Sin Dralig is the head duelist of the Jedi Order, and it was great to see the brains behind the choreography of the prequel films given his rightful dues in universe. That being said, he was promptly killed in a 4 second hologram, although the game gives the supposed top duelist a more rightful death. My issue with this boss is that it's only two phases in length and both have flat, wide arenas with nothing to them beyond scenery. Sin's AI severely underutilized his moveset, which Alex and I found is much deeper than we originally thought, and the fight also feels catered to him as you're probably low, considering this fight is directly after Sarah Kato's in the same mission. However, the challenge is not only worthy, but exciting and brings commendable variety and situational difficulty. When I mentioned that I replayed the entire game because my opinions on bosses were admittedly scuffed, this is what I had in mind. Sarah Kato was dead last for me because if you don't have an understanding of the combat beyond the basics, she is horrible. That said, with a greater knowledge of the system, her aggressive and free-flowing dual saber style is a really fun test due to her movement and animation being so different from anybody else. Believe it or not, her moveset is vaguely similar to that of Ahsoka or Starkiller and being on the receiving end over the... watching end? brings a whole new perspective to this form of combat. All things considered, she's the protege of Sin Dralig, and I find the apprentice harder than the master due mainly to the cramped arena in phase one, although with more space, the second phase is a lot more manageable. Apparently, the both of them were intended to be a gank fight, but the idea was scrapped early in concept, and both combat specialists were then split into separate encounters. No doubt, there's little to no emotional strings in this fight, you know, with Nightfall, Vader, and Order 66 and all that, but Sarah Kato is a great addition, especially for a character created for the game alone. There is much to appreciate with this game's recreation of Dooku's Last Stand, but personally, the movie fight reigns supreme. It would have been better off without the third phase, and the lack of motif on Dooku and Palpatine's parts as well as no semblance of Anakin's rise in anger leaves the boss feeling as if it was missing the point of the fight's lower importance, although it was still very fun. It's neat to note that in phase 1 only, you get to fight alongside a CPU, with that never happening at any other point in the game. Be it with a partner or not, Dooku really isn't very challenging even at low level force and combat abilities, with him being somewhat of an introduction to lightsaber combat rather than, say, your average boss. And after you start flying solo when Obi-Wan gets Barboza kicked, the fight opens up with less cramped and more creative arenas in the next two phases. In phase 3 notably, Dooku summons groups of super battle droids who among the base set of enemies are the worst. They have a ridiculous defense to lightsabers, and with two on either side, tanking at least a few rounds of their laser barrage is just something you have to deal with. Dooku's death is fine, but doesn't have that level of Sith-like barbaric anger nor manipulative appeal of Sidious, but still the fight is enjoyable and serves as a great opening to the game's bosses. I'm surprised at how disliked Mace v. Sidious is. I understand the choreography was lazy, not to mention a Jedi Master of Mace's caliber would have reacted to Anakin's obvious change in emotion and attempted murder. Nonetheless, this game answered that fault in lore greatly. 
While once again Matt Lucas's portrayal of Anakin was atrociously bad, Terence C. Carson's performance of Mace Windu was brilliant and his slow turn from trying to bring Anakin back to the light to eventually just straight up roasting him. You are my opponent? Is this a joke? Gave multiple points to this fight's enjoyment value. Playing as the villain for once was neat, with each passing phase leading Anakin down a darker path. With four unique segments, there is a surprising amount of variation throughout, especially for a political office, with the first phase being fought in Palpatine's personal HQ where he was originally interrogated. I find this one to be the most fun because Mace's AI is the weakest and you can do so many different moves with minimal cost, but that's not to say Mace doesn't put up a fight because in all fairness this is one of the hardest bosses in the game. The next two phases are fought on Palpatine's landing platforms, the second is less interesting than the third due to its shortened length, although with Mace's noticeable turn from hope to survival he gets more aggressive and the infight banter picks up as well. Up to phase 4 I never really struggled however, and maybe this is just me, but I had to go zen with the last phase to beat it, and it felt as if Mace could read what I was going to do well before I had calculated my move myself. There's also so much variation in height found throughout that the geometry messes with the gameplay, but still the top moments of this fight from cutscenes and combat alike make for a fantastic take on one of the weaker duels in live action Star Wars. As with every mission in the game, the differences added to separate itself from the movie, create style and intrigue, and fill in gaps that said movie couldn't capture due to time and budget restraints. I find Grievous v Kenobi to be the worst live action duel because of so much potential being thrown by the wayside, and going into this game knowing, or rather expecting this to just simply be longer than the movie fight, I held it in a higher regard. Grievous's AI is a bit repetitious, with him constantly spamming his XXY combo, although what I appreciate most about this fight is that it starts off exactly where the movie should have continued, with his TSMEU 6 wheel bike smashing into a room and the lightsaber combat ensuing. Phase 1 isn't anything notably spectacular outside of just great back and forth fighting, although the second phase with a bigger arena and better camera allows for an overall more enjoyable experience. If this game counts towards power scaling feats, I believe you can scale Grievous above almost every Sith Lord in the Legends continuity besides Cadus, Sidious, Krayt, Valkorion, and that generally considered 5th dimensional group of Sith, even though he isn't a Sith nor Force sensitive. His suit prevents the use of Force Grip, meaning he's, in terms of proven feats, totally resistant to everything Force related except Force Choke, not to mention he knocks out Obi-Wan, defeats 6 Jedi, among multiple other feats. Basically what I'm saying is that Legends Grievous is a total badass and this fight perfectly sums up his character, a mixture of arrogance, cowardice, and extravagance. It's hard to take complete control at any point in the fight as his AI is extremely aggressive, although with a mixture of abilities and combos you should be able to get through the first three phases pretty alright, leading to my favorite moment in the game. There is just so much to appreciate with Obi-Wan's Vader-esque escape, to then Grievous's realization that this is his final stand, and in desperation unlocking his third and fourth arms and lightsabers to change up his moveset. The fourth phase is far superior to Grievous's telegraph death by way of Obi-Wan's blaster, with it instead being a flashy show-off of his suit's abilities and his four saber moveset. While short-circuiting may not be as entertaining as burning alive and exploding from the inside out, this boss fight does justice to Grievous and Obi-Wan's three-year rivalry that only the Clone Wars comes close to exacting. It's difficult translating impactful moments across different mediums, nonetheless the interpretation then even meeting expectations, although if anything a testament to how well made the ending of Revenge of the Sith is, the battle of the heroes both in cinema and game are the cream of the narrative crop. Like the Mace Windu boss, there's so much spatial variation from phase to phase, pointing out not only creativity but a desire from a developer standpoint for you to change the way you approach the fight itself. The first phase was really great and settles you into either Vader's aggressive style or Obi-Wan's defensive, melee-based moveset, although the Separatist control room is when the fight flips itself on its head. While it lacks an Anti-Obi spin in that whole moment from the movie, there's so much room along with tables and control panels that you're free to just do whatever you want. I blend phases 3 and 4 as just a singular, longer phase, as both do little to add significant difference, although the Smash Bros. S camera in phase 3 is worth noting. The bridge to follow, however, points out how powerful and useful the charged heavy attacks from both Vader and Obi-Wan are, and I find this rather than the last phase to be the crux of the fight. The AI gets noticeably more aggressive, and I find this as well as phase 6 way harder than just about every other segment in the game when you fight Obi-Wan over Anakin specifically. And after a decently accurate take on the lava bit found in the film as well, you duke it out on one of the Mustafarian droids and this isn't my favorite moment due to the cramped space allowing for little mistakes to be had, although if you push aggressively, in all likelihood you'll end up fine. 
With two separate missions comes two separate endings, the first being the canonical birth of Vader, and the other a what-if conspiracy turned reality, with Vader actually murdering Sidious and claiming the galaxy's throne for himself to one day become full potential Vader. This fight is just as much an endurance test as it is a challenge to counter the characters you've been using in all the previous missions, and as a climax to the game it delivers well beyond what I expected. Thanks so much for watching! In my opinion, this is one of the best Star Wars games created to date, even though graphically it was underwhelming and once again there also being no John Williams score to back. Although with that, this game's bosses were greatly enjoyable beyond simply being interactive takes on the incredibly exciting live action fights, with, in my opinion, multiple of said fights found in Revenge of the Sith being better than those in Revenge of the Sith or Revenge of the Sith. Anyways, as an addition to Xbox's final batch of backwards compatible titles, for only $9.99 I recommend this to everyone a fan of challenging lightsaber combat and the movies themselves. Hopefully soon we'll get a first look at Fallen Order 2 and maybe even gameplay of the KOTOR remake, but it is truly incredible how great and long-standing Star Wars' video game catalog is. Remember to like and subscribe if you haven't, and leave a comment on your thoughts, game recommendations, or whatever's on your mind. Once again, thanks for watching, and be on the lookout for weekly Wednesday uploads. That's all for now. Deuces.